the prologue to the Fury by Alex Michaelides. So excited. Never open a book with the weather. Who was it who said that? I can't remember. Some famous, famous writer, I expect. Whoever it was, they were right. Weather is boring. Nobody wants to read about weather. Particularly in England, where we have so much of it. People want to read about people. They generally skip descriptive paragraphs, in my experience. Avoiding the weather is good advice, which I know disregard, which I now disregard at my peril. An exception to prove the rule, I hope. Don't worry, my story isn't set in England, so I'm, t I'm not talking about rain here. I draw the line at rain. No book should start with rain ever. No exceptions. I'm talking about wind. The wind that whirls around the Greek islands. Wild, unpredictable Greek wind. Wind that drives you mad. The wind was fierce that night. The night of the murder. It was ferocious, furious, crashing through trees, tearing along pathways, whistling, wailing, snatching all other sounds and racing off with it. Leo was outside when he heard the gunshots. He was on his hands and knees at the back of the house, being sick in the vegetable garden. He wasn't drunk, just stoned. Mia culpa, I am afraid. He'd never smoked weed before. I probably shouldn't have given him any. After an initial semi-ecstatic experience, apparently involving a supernatural vision, he felt nauseous and started throwing up. Just then, the wind sped toward him, hurling the sound straight at him. Bang, bang, bang. Three gunshots in quick succession. Leo pulled himself up as steadily as he could. He battled his way against the gale in the direction of the gunfire, away from the house, along the path, through the olive grove, toward the ruin. And there, in the clearing, sprawled on the ground, was a body. The body lay in a widening pool of blood, surrounding, surrounded by the semicircle of ruined marble columns, casting it particularly in shadow. Leo cautiously approached it, peering at the face. Then he staggered backwards, his expression contorted in horror, opening his mouth to scream. I arrived at that moment, along with the others, in time to hear the beginnings of Leo's howl. Before the wind grabbed the sound from his lips and ran off with it, disappearing into the dark. We all stood still for a second, silent. It was a horrifying moment terrifying like the climatic scene in a greek tragedy but the tragedy didn't end there it was just beginning and that was only four minutes there's a short Chapter 1. This is a tale of murder, or maybe that's not quite true. 
as its heart, it's a love story. At its heart, it's a love story, isn't it? The saddest kind of love story about the end of love, the death of love. So I guess I was right the first time. You may think you know the story. You probably read about it <clears throat> at at the read about it at the time. The tabloids loved it, if you recall. Murder Island was a popular headline, unsurprising, really, as it had all all had all the perfect ingredients for a press sensation. A reclusive ex-movie star, a private Greek island, cut off by the wind, and of course, a murder. A lot of rubbish was written about that night. All kinds of wild and accurate theories about what may or may not have taken place. I avoided all of it. I had no interest in reading misinformation, misinformed speculation about what might have happened on the island. I knew what happened. I was there. Who am I? Well, I am the narrator of this tale, and also a character in it. There were seven of us in all, trapped on the island. One of us was a murderer. Before you start laying bets on which of us did it, I feel duty bound to inform you that this is not a wood unit. Thanks to Agatha Christine, we all know how this kind of story is meant to play out. A baffling crime followed by a dogged investigation, an ingenious solution, then, if you're lucky, a twist in the tell. But this is a true story, not a work of fiction. It's about real people in a real place, if anything. It's a why done it, a character study, an examination of who we are and why we do the things we do. What follows is my sincere and heartfelt attempt to reconstruct the events of that terrible night, the murder itself, and everything that led up to it, I pledged to present to you with the plain, unvarnished truth, or as near to it as I can get. Everything we did said and thought, but how, I hear you ask, how is it possible? How can I possibly know it all? Not just every action taken, everything said and done, but everything undone, unsaid. All the private thoughts in one another's minds. For the most part, I am relying on the conversations we had before the murder and afterwards. Those, those of us who s survived, that is, as for the dead, I trust you'll grant me artistic license regarding their interior life. Given I am a playwright by trade, I am perhaps better qualified than most for this particular task. My account is also based on my notes taken before and after the murder. A war word of, of explanation regarding this, I have been in the habit of keeping notebooks for some years now. I wouldn't call them diaries. They're not as structured as that. They're just a record of my thoughts, ideas, dreams, snatches of conversations I overhear, my observations of the world. The notebooks themselves are nothing fancy, just plain black molluscines. I have the relevant notebook from that year 
open now by my side and will no doubt consult it as we proceed. I stress all this so that if at any point during this narrative I mislead you, you will understand that it is by accident, not design, because I am clumsy, screwing the events too much from my own point of view. And An occupational hazard, perhaps, when one narrates a story in which one happens to play a minor role. Nonetheless, I'll do my best to hijack the narrative. I'll try my best not to hijack the narrative too often. Even so, I hope you'll indulge me the odd digression here and there. And before you accrue accuse me of telling my story in a labyrinthine manner. Let me remind you, this is a true story, and in real life, that's how we communicate, isn't it? We're all over the place. We jump back and forth in time, slow down the expand on some moments, fast forward through others, editing as we go, minimizing flaws and maximizing assets. We are all the unreliable narrators of our own lives. It's funny, I feel that you and I should be sitting together on a couple of bar stools right now as I tell you this tale, like two old friends drinking at a bar. This is a story for anyone who has ever loved. I say sliding a drink in your direction, a large one, you'll need it, as you settle down and I begin. I ask you not to interrupt too much, at least not at first. There will be plenty of opportunities to debate afterwards. For now, I request you politely to hear me out, as you might indulge a friend. Friends rather lengthy and anecdote it's time to meet our cast of suspects in order of importance and therefore for the moment i must reluctantly remain off stage i'll ha i'll however i'll hover in the wings waiting for my cue let us begin as we should with the star let's begin with lana I'm sorry for my lack of enthusiasm. I'm tired. 